are familiar with Eddie Sutton. Eddie Sutton uh, was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame finally uh, in April. And then just last night, uh, Eddie Sutton passed away at the age of 84. So, uh, if you're a basketball fan, you don't have to be an OSU fan. If you're just a basketball fan, you don't have to be Eddie Sutton. Uh, and then, how many of you have watched this little documentary the last few weeks? Y'all been watching that? Okay. You have you? So this is my childhood. I was a child of the 90s and 80s and 90s, and so watching this about the Chicago Bulls, I uh, really enjoyed that. There's been a lot of things that have happened, a lot of things that have changed, a lot of things that we've been through over the last few weeks. And I'm starting to think about it. Where, where do we go from here? What do we talk about? Because we could really go a thousand different directions, and we could, you know, let's talk about this thing, we'll go this way, or let's look at this, or let's explore this, and there's so many different ways that we can do this. And so I almost, I really just took it literally. What is our, what is our next step? And so I want to share, I want to look at a story this morning about actual next steps. Being able to take that next step in faith and what that looks like. And so if you have the Bible, but you can follow along with us. If not, we have the, the scriptures up here on the screen. It's the John chapter 4. John chapter 4, if you want to turn over there. I'll give you some background on this story as we go along, and we'll talk about uh, some different dynamics of it when we get through it and read this story. So John chapter 4, and verse 46, is where we're going to start. John 4, verse 46. It says, Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. Remember that from John chapter 2. There was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, we'll pause right there. We've got two different places that are mentioned right here. Cana, and then we have Capernaum. Now, if you are wondering where these are as far as location, I'll try my best to show you here, but Capernaum is this one right up here, right by the Sea of Galilee. You can see on the kind of the northwest side there. Cana is way over here. I say way over here, it's about 20 miles, which isn't much to us. But when, when you're walking 20 miles, that's a long way. So keep that in mind. 20 mile difference there between Cana and Capernaum. So you go on to the text, verse 47. When he heard, this royal official, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. I don't think he's necessarily condemning this man. He is talking to the crowd. So he's saying this for their benefit as well. Verse 49, the royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He was imploring him, the verse before, in that great chance there, he's not just asking Jesus once. He didn't come 20 miles and say, Jesus, will you heal my son? And then just take no for an answer and walk off. He's, he's continually asking Jesus, please come heal my son. Verse 50, Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. He takes Jesus at his word and Jesus says, your son is healed, go. And no longer asks, no longer argues, he simply turns away from Jesus and he walks and takes that first step, some 20 miles, back to the park. As you get there, he would have, part of being in, uh, in there in the Sea of Galilee, part of that walk to Cana would have been uphill. And I, I, Remember the, the times when my parents or my grandparents would say, you know, we used to walk to, skid, walk to school uphill in the snow, and you've heard those types of stories. This, he actually walked uphill, part of this journey to get to Cana, and he hears about this man, Jesus. And he's heard that Jesus can do certain things, and so he's going to go find him. And then he finally gets there, he tells Jesus, my son is dying, and he's asking him again and again, he, what he wants is Jesus to come with him. He says, come with me. My son is dying. And Jesus just simply, instead of going with him, he says, your son's healed. You can go. And the man takes Jesus at his word. And he simply turns around. And he begins this long journey back 
Capernaum. As he was going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So he doesn't get all the way home. He doesn't make the full 20 miles. He stopped at some point. He inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. See, the man still doesn't even understand it. He asked him, when did he make this turn and start feeling better? I'm sure the servants had to fill him in. No, 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 he's not recovering. He's recovered. He's completely healed. They said, yeah, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. You may have a note there in your Bible, the seventh hour. In Jewish uh, culture, it would be 1 p.m. Now, there's some people that think that maybe John was using his Roman time, and he's talking about 7 p.m. He doesn't have a whole lot of change on the story. The man is still making this journey, whether he's going in the heat of the day or at night. Uh, he asked about this, when, when is he healed? They said, 7th hour, so 1 o'clock. And the man remembers, Father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed. And, not just him, his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. I'll point out to you there, John kind of wraps that little section up. He says this is again the second sign that Jesus performed. This is not the second miracle that he had done overall. It's just the second one in this area. So he's kind of making sure we understand that qualifying. And for example, John 2 says, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many people believed in his name and observed his signs, which he was doing. That's chapter 2. Chapter 3, I want to talk with Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, Jesus, I understand that you're able to do these signs. So Jesus had been doing other miracles up to this point. This is just the second one that he does in this region. So John tells us that. So here's what we have. This is the actual area Obviously, it's a little bit more developed now. And you may not be able to see it very well, but way over here on the far left, there's a little black cheese over here. So Cana is right in there. And then you see how the plane drops off here. It's closer to sea level. The Pernum is probably somewhere way over here on the screen. So somewhere between here and over here, as this man makes this journey, his servants stop him and tell him, Good news. So I want to think about this story for a little bit. Think about what is going on in all the different sides of this story. Imagine being this man and going this distance. We don't know if he was in that area already or if he heard about Jesus and then went and returned to Cana uh, immediately. But we know that he's in pain and he finds Jesus. He tells him that his son is dying. And he's begging Jesus, just come, come heal him. And to this man, well, we don't we understand that miracles usually happen right then and there. We're able to see the evidence. We're able to see the proof. And we think, I've heard about Jesus doing things, and Jesus has always been there when those miracles occur. So it doesn't really cross his mind that maybe Jesus could do this and not yet be in the same area as his son. So he's wanting him very much to come home with him. My son can be healed. I have faith that you can heal him. But please come with me. And Jesus doesn't do it. He simply says, go. Your son is healed. Now imagine how hard that would be to be in that man's position and to simply say, okay. Say so, Jesus. And take off. He's not getting in his car and driving back to the permit. Okay? He's, he's walking 20 miles. He's come to find Jesus, and he simply has to go off of Jesus' word that your situation is improved. I just fixed it. And he has to say, okay, I believe you, and go back. Imagine being the servants at home with the son. Here's a guy that's on his deathbed. Maybe you've got a wet rag on his forehead, he's you're tending to him, he's laying there in the bed, and all of a sudden he sits up and he's fine. That really messed with your day, wouldn't it? This guy is all of a sudden fine, and, and maybe we understand that our, our master went to go see this guy named Jesus, and maybe he has something to do with it. Maybe they don't know that. And now they're just wondering, how in the world did this happen? But they do know it's good news. They run to try to find the master to try to tell him what has happened. And so they go out and they share the news with him. 
You also have to think about what's going on in this guy's head. Some of you have children, have grandchildren, and if your child was on their deathbed, and you've gone this to great lengths to find this man who everyone says can, can heal, can change your situation in life, and then you finally start finding, and you say, I need you to come and heal my son, and he says, he's not going to do it. He simply says, your son's healed. You can go. Would you be able to accept that? Would you be able to take Jesus at his word and just start walking you, taking that next step back? And the whole way you're walking home, what do you think? Man, I hope this works out. I hope this guy is who he says he is. I hope he can do what he says he can do. Because what happens if I get home and my son is not well? I just walked another 20 miles. If I get home and my son is dead, then what do I do? Turn back around and go find Jesus? He's long gone by then. So you're taking a big risk that Jesus can do what he said he can do. And I'm going to just take one step at a time. And he is expecting and hoping that when he gets home, the son is going to be healed. And you see that his, his faith, he kind of moves from different parts of faith. Some of us believe simply because we have to. We have certain events go on in our life, and we, we might consider that a crisis. I believe simply because my circumstances are my path. Then he gets a little bit confident in his faith. He believes Jesus' words and he starts walking. And then that faith is confirmed because his servants say he's healed. They say, He says, When was he healed? I say, One clock yesterday. And you remember, that's when Jesus told me he was healed. So now his faith is confirmed. And then it says, Not only he believes, but his whole family. So now his faith is contagious. He's passing this on. And I don't know where you are in your faith. You're just simply believing because you have to. You feel like you're just in such a bad situation. That's your only way out. I don't know if you're believing because you're hopeful. You're confident in your faith. Maybe you've seen Jesus do something in your life and your faith is confirmed. And you fully believe that Jesus is able to do what he says. Maybe you've got to that point where you want to share that faith with others. That's the point of contagious. We don't know exactly what's going on in this guy's head other than he has to make this walk. He's not listening to an iPod. He's not in his car, so he can't listen to the radio. He doesn't have anybody with him, most likely. So he is alone with his thoughts on this road, walking some 20 miles, at least until his servants stop him and tell him to get He simply takes Jesus at his word and understands that this guy said that he can he can change my future. He can touch my future events and make things better. I want us to think about this for us. Because this man, he literally called us the faithful. He walks all night in faith. He just takes Jesus at his word, your son's healing, and he starts off. We know in scripture that. We are supposed to have this type of faith. That we are to walk by faith and not by faith. And can I just tell you that that's really hard sometimes. It's really hard for us. We like to see results. We like to see things here and now. And that, like that's a concrete evidence right in front of us. And I bet that man would have loved to have Jesus come to his house instead. And just to see his son be healed with Jesus there, that would give him a whole lot more belief, a lot less belief. That's not what he does. So he has to walk by faith all night. I want us to look at this application because you and I, for you and I, it's different. We understand the end of the story. We understand that Jesus wins. That we have the victory through Christ. I don't know when you hear this coronavirus stuff is going to be over. I don't even think the so-called ex experts on TV know. And here's why. None of us have been through this. Never in any of our lifetimes have we experienced something like this that has kept us from meeting together for 10 weeks. And as much as I want to believe people and their projections, I think they're guessing just as much as we are. I don't know when this is going to be over. I don't know what it's going to look like in another 10 weeks. Only get to the other side of it. I do know 
that Jesus is there and he is our only one. So we need to take him at his word and just take the next step to walk in faith. You and I have promised Jesus. This man didn't have that. We have been given so many promises throughout the Bible, we could spend the whole rest of the day going through every promise in Scripture that God has given to us. I just want to share with you one. You're familiar with this verse. Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing. Oh. Put the coronavirus in there if you want to. Will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we don't know when this is going to end. We don't know what it's going to look like on the other side. But I do know if there's anybody who can be hopeful, oh, if there's any group that can be confident, that Jesus can positively affect our future is us. We don't walk by faith because the road is going to be easy, but because we know who is at the destination. And we know who walks with us. And so we must take the next step. We have these promises. We have God's word. We know how it is, church. And we should be confident in that. We should be hopeful. I want to show you one last uh, verse here this morning. If you're familiar with Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the writer there will make a connection between hope and faith in chapter 11. We're, we're familiar with that chapter. Here's all the great men and women of faith. It talks about faith and hope. And it'll go on to talk about the unchangeableness of Christ. Chapter 13 it says, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Right? We have this things that we're building on, this hope, this faith, the fact that Christ will always be there, he's always the same. And he'll mention hope, this word hope, three times in chapter 6. And I want to share with you the last one of those, here in verse 19. He says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, and hope is both sure and steadfast. It's a good thing to have hope. But if you don't have hope in the right thing, it's going to fail. If we have hope in Christ, we, we know that we have an anchor that will never fail us, that will never let us down. And it makes it even more easier for us to do those hard, tough things like stepping out of faith. It's not going to be easy. I certainly can promise you it's not always fun. You know that. But we have an advantage that this man and John Ford didn't. We know how it is. <laughs> we know what's waiting on the other side. We know that Jesus can impact our future because he's already there. And I don't know when any of this is going to end. But I do know that if we stick with Jesus, if we allow him to be our anchor, our hope, you and I are going to be just fine. But we are going to get through. So what I want us to do this week, very simply, I just want you to trust in God's promises. He's given you those promises for a reason. Read them. Reflect upon them. Think about what God has promised all of us. You and I are going to be okay. Jesus wins. So do we. And then secondly, just take that next step. Some of you have been more impacted by this virus than others. Health-wise, financial, uh, obviously social. This is new for all of us, right? We have to be in this building and sit this way. We all have to go through all these different things. It's affected us in different ways. And it may you may be going through something scarier than what I'm going through or the next person next to you is going through in regards to how this virus is affecting your life. But I do know best thing for us to do is just to take the first step. To know that Jesus has promised us victory. To know that in this world, to walk in faith. To 
The road is not always going to be easy, but it is going to be worth it. So whatever that looks like for you, take that next step. Step out in faith and be able to trust in God and know everything that is worth Let's pray. Well, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time. I know that we have, many of us have looked forward to this day and we can be together again. Father, we obviously look forward to the day when we can be, when all of us can be together again. We can be meeting together on a regular basis and we can have some sense of normalcy. But Father, help us to not be so quick to get to that place that we miss out on the lessons that you would have us learn during this time. Father, help us to learn patience. Help us to learn gratitude. Help us to learn thanksgiving. Help us to learn how to reach out to others. Father, help us to be better people than we were when this whole thing started. Father, I ask that you be with each of us this week. Help us to trust in the many promises that you have given us know that we can walk in faith, that whatever that looks like for us, Father, that we take that next step, that we take you at your word and simply do our part. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. For his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. You know, there's been a lot of work for them to come together, the other things that they've been working on before the day, and the airline and everything. And Eric has put in a lot of work. Any of you have been able to see the uh, sermons of the week on FaceTime and on the website. And on Wednesday night, we participated in the Zoom uh, and some lessons where we were kind of Job this he actually picked out most of the songs that went with the list today, and you can see how he ties it in. Uh, you know, we know we're both the songs. We have an anchor that he can go to the song. He said, I asked him short. He picked out these songs that tied into that list. I think we can all uh, take the uh, courage and the strength of that. We'll have one song in the field office. Now it's the
take care of this bullet for their wings. And uh, at the end of the year, they're going to be stepping down from that job. We're going to need somebody that is willing to take that on. If you are willing, come see one of those elders. Uh, it's not something you're going to pick up. Probably say, I'll do it and start doing it the next day. They can train you on what, what they do and how they put it together. So we would be very appreciative if we could get some Let's remember all our shut-ins. Are you 